Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. and it's proposed by the FIDO Alliance, which is a, an alliance comprised by more than 40 key companies, including Amazon, Apple, Google, and so on. So this protocol has many advantages. Basically, uh, users don't need to remember passwords. Um, it has been designed with a user in mind, so it's quite uh, easy to use. It is resistant to phishing attacks, and also it's widely adopted because you have all these big participants in the alliance that are taking care that then this is adopted in the, in the different platforms. And also it's very alive, so there are constant improvements. For example, last year there, there was this new kind of rebranding of uh, the FIDO2 credentials to passkeys that I will talk about a bit later. So it's like this is constantly improving. And the protocol, just, just to dive into that, uh, the protocol has four main participants. We have the user that wants to authenticate into a remote web application. For that, they will access it through a web browser, and they will use a, a secure hardware, like the one I showed before, uh, to do that. The protocol has like two sub-protocols. WebAuthn is the, the sub-protocol that governs the communication between the hardware token, the browser, and the server. And also the user participates because uh, the, the user will have to authorize certain operations in the hardware token. And then we have CTAP, that is a protocol that governs the communication between the token and the browser, and is intended to make sure that only a specific browser is allowed to communicate with, with the hardware token. The protocol has two phases. In the first phase, the user will register this hardware token that they own uh, to be used to authenticate in the web application, so that afterwards, in the, in the next iterations, they will be able to use it to authenticate with this uh, the hardware token. So in the registration phase, uh, there are two processes happening. One is that there is an attestation of the token properties. This means that the token is going to provide some information to the web application about which are the characteristics of this hardware token, like which are the security features, which is the brand, which is the model, so that the web application or the, the web server can decide if it's a valid hardware token to, uh, for the users to log in, in their service. And also, there is another step where uh, a set of credential keys is generated that will be registered in the web application or in the web server, and later on they will be used to authenticate. So let's look at the cryptography behind that. Uh, for the CETA part, we have an operation of generating, so there is a session establishment between the, the token and the browser when we, when we plug it into our computer and we start using it. And during this, uh, this session establishment, we are generating a keeper for, uh, for chems. Uh, there is a chem decryption and a symmetric encryption operation that is performing the hardware token. And then for the uh, web Ausen part, um, we are generating a key pair for signing, that's the credential keys. And then we are also doing this uh, attestation that I said before, which usually comprises uh, signing a challenge, the public key of the signing key pair that was generated in the step before, and maybe some other information like a model or uh, the brand of the authenticator. And I wanted to do a, a small digression into attestation because actually um, FIDO2 allows uh, different modes of attestation, and depending on the mode you use, you will do some cryptographic operations or others. For example, if you use the mode none, there is no attestation at all, there is no signature, you use self, you will use the same credentials that you generated here, the signing key pair, and you will use the private key for um, signing the attestation message. So you will do a signature operation. Uh, in the case of, of basic, the attestation key pair is generated during the manufacturing time, uh, stored in the, in the tokens. Um, a same key, the same key pair is uh, shared between a batch of different tokens, 
so that uh, well, in order to uh, make sure that uh, well, for privacy for privacy guarantees, sorry, so to make sure that within a certain batch you cannot distinguish a, a specific token. And then you will use uh, this key pair that was uh, stored during the manufacturing time to sign the attestation message. So here you also have to do only one signature for the attestation. Then we have other modes like the privacy or anonymity CA where you may um, generate, uh, well you, the token may generate uh, different key pairs for attestation uh, up to uh, every time that you register to a new service. So in this, in this case you will have a key generation and then a signing operation for the attestation part. And then there are other modes that are more focused on uh, uh, privacy preserving properties uh, called DIA or EPID that are not part of the FIDO2 uh, standard actually. They could be potentially and they are used in other, environment, in, in other environments. But in case we use those modes, uh, we would need to perform even more operations. It would be not only like key generation and signing, but we also need to do, we would also need to do uh, zero knowledge proofs, for example. So going back to FIDO2, to the, to the rest of the protocol, uh, in the authentication step, we will still, we will again need to um, set up a session, a CTAP session between the token and the web browser, so we'll need to do the same operations in that side. And for the web browser, we will only need to perform a signature over the challenge sent by the web application, so one signing operation. Um, I also wanted to explain a bit about the passkeys because this was a rebranding from, I think it was end of last year, or beginning of this, um, for the FIDO2 credentials, so uh, maybe you are more familiar with this term because it's appearing everywhere. But it's not only a renaming of the credentials, of, of the FIDO2 credentials, uh, they also introduced a concept that is credential synchronization uh, among different devices, which means that uh, I may generate the, uh, the keeper that I was talking about uh, on my phone, and then the private key will be synchronized to other devices that I have um, where I can log with the same account as in my phone. So the synchronization will happen, for example, with the devices that where I log in with my Google account or with my Apple account, and so on. And this is for convenience, of course, but um, in case that we have applications with more uh, strict security requirements, we may still want to use um, credential device-bound credentials, like the ones that usually live in, in hardware tokens. And this is one that, that we care more about or that we think are more um, challenging in the, from the point of view of migrating to PQC. Anyway, in the case of uh, having these uh, credentials that can be synchronized or not, depending on the flavor, uh, then attestation can become <coughs> will become more important because um, it will allow us to know how a credential was generated, if it's one that, if it's of uh, the type that can be synchronized or not, and in which kind of hardware it is being stored. So we'll have more work on the attestation side. Okay, so now that we know a bit more about the, the FIDO2, um, let's see how, how ready it is for, PQ, for PQC. Well, as we have seen um, in the cryptographic operations, if we take into account registration and authentication, and then the most common attestation types are actually the ones that are in the standard, non-self, basic, attestation, CA, and anonymity CA, uh, we see that we only need the standard signatures and CAMs, for which we already have uh, replacements that are being standardized now. So we are in a pretty good position in that case. As I said before, if we uh, used other attestation types that are not part of the standard now, but could be because of their nice privacy properties, we would need to have zero knowledge proofs, randomized credentials, and other things that are more advanced and for which we don't have a direct replacement. Although there are several um, proposals already uh, for um, having a quantum resistant algorithm that, that could be used. So, yeah, we have some preliminary results. Um, of course, they are not as performant as the uh, classic cryptography solutions, uh, but still, uh, it seems that there's uh, some room for improvement and for research in that area. So if anybody is interested, I really um, support you <laughs> working on it <laughs> and to, to get uh, better performance algorithms and protocols. 
So now let's look at the practical limitations um, and alternatives that we have for uh, using PQC in this kind of uh, FIDO2, in, in the FIDO2 protocol and in this kind of devices, no? I'm first looking at the storage. So for looking at these uh, practical limitations, we took uh, the two main open source um, uh, players in the industry of FIDO2 that are solo keys and nitro key. And we look at the two generation of devices that they have supporting this protocol, solo one and solo two, nitro, nitro key FIDO2, nitro key three. For the first generation, we have exactly the hardware that they are using. And for the second generation, <coughs> we have the hardware in which they base their development. So we can have an idea of like the capabilities uh, of these devices. And then in order to see like, okay, how, how, would, how, how would are we in terms of storage? Well, we took the, the base firmware of uh, these two um, of solo key and nitro keys, like which is, which is the smallest piece of code that is required here. And then uh, we looked at the size of the code of uh, adding additional uh, quantum algorithms. Uh, we took these sizes from the PQM4 project. Uh, so then, um, well, it, as you can see here, I guess because it's uh, a bit more complex than the other algorithms, in the case of Falcon, we have a, um, well, the, the code size is quite big. Uh, and it could be too big for all devices, right? So uh, here we have uh, something that could be improved. Maybe I actually, maybe in the PQ Clean or uh, in a talk that was before this morning, you know, they were talking about how to minimize the code as much as possible. So for sure, uh, we could try to, to look at those numbers and see, and see if for sure it would improve this situation. Um, in the case that we use the lithium, uh, of course, if, uh, because for the chems we will need to use uh, Kyber, uh, and there's the possibility you know, that we can reuse some code between Kyber and the lithium, and then we can save space. And then the other thing that we looked at is that, uh, the number of credentials that we could store in those, um, in those hardware devices, in those hardware tokens, because the number of credentials that we can store will limit the number of services in which we can uh, register, okay? And well, what, what we know is that the solo keys uh, tokens right now offer uh, storing up to 50 credentials. Uh, we didn't have the numbers for nitro key, so we look at another player that is uh, YubiKey, uh, Yubico, sorry, so the YubiKey is allowed to store up to 25 credentials. And the numbers we did are that uh, if we try to store um, um, these credentials by using the lithium or Falcon, uh, it seems that uh, we wouldn't have enough space to support that many. So we can either restrict and you can use your token to, uh, to register to less services, or I don't know, maybe we don't need to, I'm digressing here, but maybe we don't need to uh, register to 50 different services because in some cases we have single sign-on and things like that, federation. But otherwise, if you want to be able to register to 50 different services um, using um, your device, uh, there is another alternative that is uh, using another type of credentials supported by FIDO2. So in FIDO2, we have credentials called discover discoverable credentials that are stored in the token, um, but also we have the possibility of not storing the credentials in the hardware, but in the server where we register in an encrypted form with a master key that is uh, owned by the, by the hardware token. So that when I want to authenticate, I will download the encrypted block, decrypt it, and then use the credential to sign the, the challenge. And in this case, of course, we don't have a limitation. I was gonna say, I, we don't have a limitation on the number of credentials that we can use because uh, we only need to store a master key, but we will still need to store some identifiers, so potentially we would have a, a limit, but it would be much higher. Then regarding runtime, these are numbers from um, some months ago. Um, so the first part of the, 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 the part of the, that's your left, uh, of, the, of the graphics is from the, from the paper from Google from last year. And then we got some other numbers uh, using the uh, a Cortex M33, which is the one used in the development boards for solo key. So to get some orientation numbers of how we are in terms of uh, performance of the post-quantum algorithms. And the idea is that we wanted to get these numbers because um, we wanted to know potentially how long it could take uh, a registration 
or an authentication using this protocol um, because this is very important from the user perspective, of course, if it takes like three minutes to authenticate in some place, I, I don't know, the user may, well, I don't think it's, it's the best user experience in the world, no, and, and maybe users would just um, remove the token to in, and interrupt the protocol thinking that something went wrong or authorize an operation um, several times, which could be potentially a, a security issue. Um, so yeah, we wanted to know uh, basically where we were uh, because of this and also uh, there could be some problem with the uh, timeouts between the different services uh, and so on. So we see that the Lithium seems to offer like the best times uh, for the key generation and the signature generation. We have values that are under uh, one second, which is great. Uh, this was, um, so this doesn't take into account any operation that we have to do due to attestation. If we add attestation, uh, that means that besides the key generation, uh, we will need also to perform a signature. We still see that the numbers, if we use the lithium, are still uh, below this uh, second. But we wanted also to see if we could have like an alternative where we don't only use the lithium and we, we could get some advantages. So we did a small experiment uh, combining the lithium and coke. And we thought, okay, what, what if we didn't have to um, generate attestation keys because, for example, we are using the attestation mode basic where the keys were already embedded in the token from the manufacturing process. So in registration, we only have to do uh, a signature for attestation. We don't have to generate the keys, no? Then we can uh, allow ourselves to use an algorithm that may have a long key generation time but can be uh, efficient during the signature time, like hop, and use it for the attestation part Still, for the authentication scheme, we would need to use the lithium because we need to generate a key pair for registering, a new key pair for registering to a new service. And then we would have in the registration phase a uh, key generation with the lithium, a signature for the attestation part with HOP, and in the authentication, only a signature with the lithium. In this case, the advantage uh, compared to using only the lithium is that uh, we would have a much shorter signature. Uh, for the attestation part, which can be particularly interesting because uh, during the registration phase, we are it's, it's the phase where we are sending more information uh, because we have to send also the public key of the generated key pair. If we use non-discoverable credentials, we have to send the encrypted block and so on. So anything that we can save in that in that uh, step is very important. And of course, I want to mention that in the uh, well that the, we hope that now that uh, with the with a new NIST call for alternative signature schemes, uh, we may have uh, like other interesting results and maybe we can find other combinations that can fit better into this scenario, but we still have to see that. Uh, actually, what I wanted to share is that, as I mentioned, these numbers are from uh, some months before and they were uh, obtained um, just uh, performing, like running the algorithms in this, um, in the test board for Solo2 but uh, we are in the process of publishing a new open source library um, that has a PQC implementation of FIDO2 with all the end-to-end, -end, with all the different components, like the code that runs in the, in the hardware, the code that runs in the browser or in the server. Uh, we are using the firmware, um, like the code base that both solo keys and nitro key use, so that's kind of puts us in, a, in the most realistic scenario. And the idea is that we will be able to have more, um, we will be able to get more benchmarks and more information about how these algorithms perform in a, in a more realistic scenario. And also we will be obtaining numbers uh, with some uh, other PQC algorithms. So I think it's not published today yet, but it should be during this week. And yeah, the, last, the next thing that we would like to do is, as I said, to, to have a more comprehensive benchmark. Um, then finally, um, yeah, we, we were thinking also like, um, okay, so we have all these constraints. In paper, it seems that we could go for a PQC FIDO2. Uh, now, how long is it gonna take for us to, to migrate, right? It's always the question. So we have several factors, challenge, steps here. We would need, we would need to update the FIDO2 specifications with the new algorithms, make sure that there is backwards compatibility, if we want or not. Um, uh, then, because we may have a slower key or signature generation or larger uh, signature or ciphertext, 
we may need potential changes in the hardware. E either if we don't have changes, if we don't need to change the hardware, we will need to change the software, so there will be some kind of update. Um, we may need to recertify the hardware tokens, otherwise we may need to recertify still the software, which can be faster, of course. Um, in case we have new hardware, we may need to distribute it to the end users. No? It's not something that you can do an OTA on like uh, hardware devices that the users are carrying. If it's firmware, we can do something else. And also we will have to update uh, different, um, uh, all the different actors that interact uh, in the protocol. No? We will need to update CAs, browsers, and web applications, not for 5.2 only, but for everything else, right? We are already working on it. So we try to think about the potential adoption timeline based on uh, first, think about the phases, not based on like previous um, previous migrations. Uh, I, we were using as an example uh, previous updates to the FIDO2 protocol, but also we took like the um, updates to the TPM specifications because we thought this is a, also like a protocol that relies on a trusted hardware that has to be delivered to end users. Um, and yeah, we we. We came up with these uh, different steps. We have the standardization process, update the specifications. We may have to create new hardware that has to be manufactured, tested, certified. At the same time, we can already update everything that is software, and then we need the market update, no? It can be something like, if it's in an enterprise environment, maybe you can push like that everybody gets a new token. Uh, otherwise, you may need to um, wait until uh, devices stop working and you can uh, redistribute them, no? Like the shared life it's called or something like this. Um, so yeah, uh, we have some orientative times also based on like previous um, updates, as I said, on FIDO2 and on TPMs. That's we thought, okay, that can be a, a rough idea. And that can give us a rough idea of the, um, of the numbers. And basically, if we are like, well, we are in the second half of the standardization part, no? Uh, but if we take into account that we will still need to update the specifications, create new tokens, redistribute them, and so on, we may see an adoption time between four and 10 years. Okay. So, yeah, just uh, food for thought and about uh, uh, updating the authentication systems. So, yeah, that's all uh, for my, from my side. Uh, some takeaways are that uh, we see we saw that there are some research gaps uh, regarding efficient post-quantum algorithms for attestation modes that are not only for FIDO2, and actually they are not in that standard, no, but they are also used in other environments that also rely on constrained hardware in some cases. So uh, we may need to wait for, for new algorithms or pay the price and, and, and require uh, bigger hardware. Uh, that we have uh, this uh, new implementation that is going to be public soon, and we hope to get more numbers and more interesting information for you. And finally, that the migrations take uh, well, a long time. I think we already have seen this in a lot of talks uh, yesterday and today, but yeah, stay preparing. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Tim, go to mine. Uh, can you go back to me for the, to the slides for the signature, for the secret, seas, secret key sizes? And it was like halfway through. So, yeah, here. So you say for 50 credentials, um, you need a lot of space. So 50, like you might not have space for 50 credentials. But I'm wondering for dilithium, key generation is like considerably faster than signature generation. Why didn't you not compress the private key and just store the seed? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, oh, you didn't think about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I guess we wanted to know first, like, for, and for example, there are other optimizations, as I said, uh, like we were taking the code size for the big one for project, but then there, are, there have been some people like uh, working on the, like on minimizing the code, no? So this mm -hmm. is kind of like the rough view, and then, okay, what we need to work on that, no? To be able to improve it. But yeah, storing the seed is a, is a super 
yeah, yeah, optimization. Yeah, like, I yeah. think that's for both Kyber and LSM. I'm not sure about the Falcon. Yeah, but that's that's what I was thinking. I'm not sure this works for Falcon. Yeah, for space processes it would never never work, I think. But for the other two, this you could probably store and like an infinite amount of. That's perfect because actually we didn't like the the thing about the storing the keys on the server side. So that that. Yeah, I don't better. think you need that. I think that's overly complicated. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, let's thank uh, Sonda again. Thank you. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.